Well, hello, and welcome back to our study of the book of Proverbs. Um, we're looking at what it means to be wise, how you find words to live by, how you put them into practice. What we're in the middle of right now is that section of the book of Proverbs where a father is introducing the value of wisdom to his son. We've seen already that 15 times in these first nine chapters, the phrase my son occurs as it introduces another topic related to the value of wisdom, the pitfalls of failing to follow wisdom, how wisdom protects, a call that wisdom cries out to us, on and on and on. We're going to be looking here at chapter 3, verses 1 to 4, the first of three lessons that guide us through chapter 3, or at least the first part of chapter 3. Uh, as you open your Bibles, then, as we get ready to read the text, we also want to point out that as we go through it, there's a method of reading this text at this point in the book of Proverbs. We mentioned that there's discourse going on here, so we want to take into consideration all that's being said. Later on, when we get into specific Proverbs, we'll find that well, what we need to do is look at them individually and see how they will speak to us um, and how they will instruct us as we go day by day, how we will meditate on them day by day. We'll get a few examples of Proverbs from the middle part of the book and then use that really as a model to figure out how we can read other parts of the book of Proverbs, what topics are involved, what themes are brought up, and what um, areas that we need to be working on. Clearly, what the book of Proverbs is going to be doing is contrasting the wise with the fool and the righteous with the unrighteous. Uh, what we're going to see here, as the Father speaks to the Son, is a call to that wisdom by way of instruction. We'll read that text in a moment, but I want you to just think about this for a moment. Um, when I was younger, I would look at people that are my age now and think, wow, they really have it together. They're so wise. Um, I hope that I'm that wise when I get to be that age. Now I'm that age, so to speak, and I don't feel so wise. I know that I have a long way to go, and I know it's always a life journey, but at the same time, I really feel like I need to be working on um, developing that wisdom and growing in that wisdom. And so at sometimes I feel guilty because I know that I'm not where I want to be and probably not where I should be. But at the same time, I know that anytime I go through the book of Proverbs or I consult the word of God for wisdom, uh, I can grow from that. I hope that you feel the same way in terms of the way you're going through this study, that wherever you are, however inadequate you may feel, that you will take what we're learning together and put them into practice so that we can ever become or ever be becoming the wise people that God's called us to be. And that's going to be important because I, iter I reiterated this in the first lesson, that wisdom is something that we all can attain. Wisdom is not a special spiritual endowment. It is something that we are to seek, and it can be attained by all. And so I want to continue to encourage you in that point. There's never a time to stop learning. As long as you are breathing, as long as you have time on this earth, you want to be seeking wisdom. It is a lifelong journey. And so I join you in that journey as well. If you have your Bible, then again, as I said, return to Proverbs chapter 3, verses 1 to 4. Before we actually read it, I want to go ahead and go through the outline. Uh, it's three different parts. I know that there's um, not a lot to divide up here but definitely want to be able to walk you through it. So let's put those up there real quickly. Uh, we're going to see in chapter 3, verses 1 to 2, the value of instruction. And verse 3, the value of kindness and truth. And then lastly, verse 4, the value of reputation. Uh, as we look at that, we're also going to see that another way of looking at the word reputation is the word understanding. Another way, In other words, the way people understand you and receive you. Uh, the title of our lesson is Surrender Your Time. We're going to have three different lessons entitled Surrender. Uh, we'll see two more after this, carrying on in the next succeeding passages in chapter 3 of Proverbs. So clearly there's a benefit for us to stop down at this point and deal with these three aspects of the, the, the section in Proverbs. But know that this is just a contributing text through the bigger picture of, of Proverbs 1 through 9. So I would encourage you to go back and continue to read Rome, uh, Proverbs one, Proverbs 1 through 9. Uh, I keep saying Romans. I taught a class on the letters of Paul this week, and so Romans is on my mind. What we want to do is look at the book of Proverbs and see how the author builds up to see the value of wisdom to then give instructions in wisdom. As we said, there are 15 different times in the book of Proverbs in verses or in chapters 1 through 9 where the phrase, my son, is used to introduce a topic, and we see that here as well. Let me read it to you, and then we'll walk through it verse by verse and phrase by phrase. I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible, the 2020 edition. My son, do not forget my teaching, but have your heart comply with my commandments. 
for length of days and years of life and peace they will add to you. Do not let kindness and truth leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart so you will find favor and a good reputation in the sight of God and man. Well, as you listen to that, perhaps you heard some things familiar to you from other parts of the scriptures, and we will talk about that. So let's go ahead and look first at what's going on here, the value of instruction. Now, as you look at the text, some of your Bibles may say law or teaching. Um, I've gone ahead and used the word instruction because it has a double meaning. Yes, there is teaching about what to do, how to live and what is wise, but also it's from that word Torah, which means law. But law means instruction. But as you read the text and you read the parallel statements of law and commandments, you can see that while much of the book of Proverbs is about practical living for life and not about the law of Moses per se, there's still reference to the life that we have in our relationship with God that stems from and is founded on the law. So part of wisdom is following the instruction that's been given in the covenant. That comes up in a couple of different places as well. So you have that here. You have the idea of instruction. You have the idea of law and commandments. So let's take a look at this, these first two phrases. First, there is the, the statement, my son. And again, what we mean there is that while this was Hebrew education, where the father would teach the son, we know today that the value that there's value for all people to be educated, men and women, boys and girls alike. And so I don't think it's wrong for us to say my children or my child. What we're seeing here is the value of educating our children so that they will grow up to be wise, that they will grow up to be able to make discerning decisions and see the benefit that we'll see in a moment of what it means to have that ability going with us, going with us day by day. It's interesting when you follow that up, he doesn't say remember, he says don't forget. Now, he could have said, remember my teaching. He does have a positive way of saying it in the next phrase, but he says, do not forget my teaching. In other words, I have given you instruction. I've given you law. I've given you teaching. Now that you have it, don't forget it. So what you're seeing here is from the perspective of having been giving it and will be giving it, and probably a reference to the future as you learn instruction, don't forget it. We're seeing here the negative side of it. Don't forget I guess we could turn it around and say remember, but there might be something more um, deliberate, more purposeful, more um, guided. There's another word I'm looking for, more direct, um, that when you don't forget, you have to pay attention to it more. Again, it's not simply about knowing what the words are. It's not just knowing about what the instruction is. It's about doing it ultimately. Don't forget. He goes on to say in that second phrase there, which is parallel, have your heart comply with my commandments. Now, it's important to recognize here that heart isn't your emotion. It's the seat of your will. It's the decision-making. It's how your mindset is. So when he says, have your heart comply, he's saying, put your, your whole being into it. Uh, just like don't forget means keep it top of mind. Having your heart comply means that you will willfully put these into practice, comply with commandments. In other words, that you will live in compliance with, uh, commensurate with, you will make sure that your life is guided by commandments. It's interesting that there's language here that is similar to what God gave Moses to give to the people of Israel in the wilderness, just as they're getting ready to enter the promised land. And I go back and read um, what you see in Deuteronomy chapter six, the Shema, hero Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Um, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength. And he goes on to talk about teaching the children the way they should go. There's some of that here. As we'll read in the next verse, however, we're going to see a parallel even with the Ten Commandments, with the teaching of children to honor their father and mother. What we're seeing here is, as we've seen in other parts, there should be purpose, decision-making, directedness to actually putting these things into practice. So, they are more meaningful when you do them. Don't forget the teaching. That means do the teaching. Have your heart comply with the commandments. That means willfully put them into practice. It's not enough just to know the words. What we need to do is put them into practice. Now, what the text goes on to say, and this is where I get the word value from, the author goes on to say what the result will be. I want to preface this with this statement. We know that Proverbs are practical truths proven true or practical principles proven true 
over time. General principles proven true over time. What am I getting at? We said in the first lesson that they're not promises, they're not guarantees, and they're not commands. What we find, though, is as we put these Proverbs into practice, they will generally be fulfilled in the way that our, we are given promise. We have not promised. We are given an, uh, an illustration of. Here, while we're not dealing with specific proverb or a proverbial saying, we're still seeing what the result will be is a general truth principle. That's important to say as we'll get ready to know what that general principle is and how it may or may not apply all the time. But he says this, as you remember, or to, to make the, the direct decision to put into practice the teaching, to have your heart comply, the result will be for, or the reason for doing this, is that length of days and years of life and peace they will add to you. In other words, as you are put, putting forth the commandments and living them out, fulfilling these commandments in your life, these practical applications, they will add length of days, years of life, and peace. Now, here's where the general principle comes into play. We know that there are many things that come into life that may be what we call exceptions. We know that there are people who will uh, live according to what they've been instructed, and yet they die young. We know others who have been very, very foolish, who have made poor, poor decisions in their life, and somehow they've made it to a length of day, long years. But these are general principles. We can say, to move in that direction, what we need to do is make sure that we're living according to the commandments of God, to the law of God. And of course, we now filter that in our relationship with Jesus by way of the Holy Spirit. So what we're seeing here, though, is a general principle proven true by time that if this is your goal to live long, well, the way to do that is to live according to the law of God. Now, ultimately, what we're seeing here is a benefit of living, a benefit of fulfilling the law and living out the commandments, following the instruction, which is another way of talking about wisdom, we'll see. There are these that added that, that will be added. Length of days and years of life. Um, you remember we said the Ten Commandments mentioned about honoring your father and mother. Paul picks up on this later in Ephesians when he's giving the household code, when he talks about the relationship of wives to husbands and children to parents and slaves to masters. He tells the children, honor your mother, mother and father. Uh, for it is the first commandment with a promise, and it references length of days. It references living long in the land. There's an echo here of that. In general, then, in general, what the author is saying is that this is going to add value to your life, and it could add years to your life. Bad decisions could lead to a shortened life. Again, there are exceptions. The goal, though, the purpose behind this statement is to give what is necessary to make life meaningful, to make life long, as long as God allows. There's another benefit here, and that is peace being added. This is the idea of shalom for wholeness and wellness, and it's not always necessarily just the absence of conflict, but there is a sense of wholeness and stillness. There's a certain, how do you put it, certain peace that will come with making the right decisions because those right decisions will lead to those things that will make life more meaningful will make life beneficial. Uh, there are another, a number of different ways to say that, but it's interesting what the author is doing here. There's a, a sense of peace tied in. There's, a, again, relationship language here, which comes up in the ensuing verse as well. What we're seeing here then, as the father is speaking to the son, another way of saying, this is important, now put it into practice. There are the benefits of it. Well, what we, do we find then later on in the next verse? Um, I entitled verse three, the value of kindness and truth. You're going to see other translations translate the words kindness and truth a little differently, and we'll put those in perspective as well. First, he says, do not let kindness and truth leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Here are some applications that will help you remember. Remember in the first part, the first verse, he says, don't forget. Here, he says, don't let kindness and truth leave you. It's another way of saying, hold on to these. Grasp these. Don't let them go. Don't let them leave you. Kindness and truth. Now, some translations are going to say love and faithfulness. Kindness is that word hesed. It's a covenant faithfulness. It's a covenant love. Uh, what, what the author here is saying is this idea of love and kindness needs to stay with you. This is an action as well as an attitude. 
This is about inner relationship. Truth or faithfulness has to do with being faithful to the law, being faithful to wisdom, uh, being consistent, following the truth. These things need to, need to stay with you. Don't let these things turn away from you. He gives ways for us then to keep them in a very tangible way, and in a way many would actually put into practice literally. He says, bind them around your neck, almost like a necklace. Uh, keep them around you. Keep them close. He says, write them on the tablet of your heart. Now, obviously, when he says tablet of your heart, he's not talking about literally writing them on your chest, but he's uh, when you write them on the tablet of your heart, they're inscribed in who you are in your being so that they are a very fabric of who you are. What he's doing is he's saying, as you are following the instructions and living out the commandments, there is the promise, there is the hope, there is the possibility of a long life and that peace can follow. What you need to do is keep grasping and holding on to kindness and truth, keep grasping and holding on to love and faithfulness. And there may be other translations that your Bibles use to communicate these two ideas. What I'm saying is that these need to be held on to as well. These are uh, co different components of that. There's the commandments, and then there is the notion that there is kindness and truth. This is attitude. This is action. That doesn't mean you have to wear a real necklace around your neck, but there's language reminiscent here, though not exact, of what we do find in the Shema. The words of the Shema, hear, O Israel, loving the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength. Um, Moses instructed the people, uh, God tells Moses to instruct the people, they need to wear these as boxes on their foreheads and around their wrists. That meant that this should be part of who they are from their whole being and then the actions that they do, their way they think and the actions that they perform. Many Jews today do actually literally put phylacteries around their heads and around their wrists. It's a way of remembering. Uh, sometimes we talk about uh, putting a, 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 a knot or a rubber band or something around our finger or our wrist to help us remember. What does it mean? Um, I'm wearing some bracelets that help me remember that God redeems and that I'm prayed for. I'm covered in prayer and protection. Um, this is a way to remind us uh, what, what the author is saying here is these need to be ever close to you. Don't let them get away from you. Uh, it's very dangerous to get away from the will of God. It's very dangerous to get away from the instruction of God. These words of wisdom need to be put into practice. They need to be ever top of mind keep them close, live them out, put them in your heart, put them around your neck. They should be ever close to you, almost in the sense of clothing you in wisdom. Notice then the language that the author is using here. He's not just saying, write them down, memorize them, and quote them. They become part of who you are in your very being. We can see uh, the call there to grasp wisdom, to seek after it. One byproduct then is going to be what we see in verse four, the value of reputation. Now we're going to look at another way to translate that word reputation, but at the same time, it's important to see that there's another byproduct of following the law, living according to the commandments, living according to our instruction, making wise decisions and being discerning. The author says in verse four, so you will find favor and a good reputation in the sight of God and man. I admire people that are very wise. I sometimes am jealous of people that are very wise and I'm like, where did you get that learning? That's wonderful. And I, I see that in so many people and I hope that at some point I can impart that wisdom as well through my life and decisions and words. What happens then is there is a certain reputation, a certain understanding people have of you when you can exhibit that kind of wisdom. You will find favor and a good reputation. People will look upon you with... Um, with respect, um, they will seek to emulate what you're doing. They will seek to know how you live and how you do life and what makes you tick, so to speak. You will find favor. There will be uh, a welcome of your wisdom. But it's not just in general. The author here says that that will come in the sight of God and of man as we are fulfilling the will of God through wisdom then God will look upon us with good understanding. Maybe he can look down and smile as we put into practice the things he's taught us. And of course, there is the, 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 comp, the component there that I mentioned with regard to uh, the idea of humanity or man or other people respecting you. 
this is very reminiscent, if you're familiar, with two other people in the scriptures that are described in this way. If you go back to 1 Samuel, you remember that Hannah was childless and she prayed for a long, long time uh, to have a child. And God heard her prayer and she conceived and gave birth to Samuel. He went on to serve the Lord in the temple or in the sanctuary um, with uh, Eli. And we are told there in chapter 2, near the end of chapter 2, that he grew in wisdom and stature in favor with God. And man, something along those lines, uh, he, he has that that growth process. He grew in his wisdom. He grew in, in his relationship with God. And he was elevated among the people. People looked up to him. We also know of someone from the New Testament is described as growing in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. And that is the Son of God himself, Jesus. We know that he's God in the flesh. We know he's also born as a child. And what we see there is at the end of chapter two, after he is um, visited with the leaders in the temple, we're told that he grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. It's important to know that wisdom is important for Jesus. And we know later that he is almost the embodiment of wisdom. We can talk about him as the embodiment of wisdom. And all these things about the wisdom sayings we have can kind of be fulfilled in him. He embodies those. And yet he was a human being who needed to grow and needed to grow physically. He did grow in wisdom. Uh, we do think we, he grew in knowledge. There were times when he would learn things. Um, but it wasn't just with his father. It was with man. Now, we also know that there were those who opposed him. But there was a time in which he was growing. Those things that we can emulate ourselves. Uh, what we want to do is seek after wisdom so that we may understand it and put it into practice. So that we can um, live out our life in a way that is pleasing to God. It may be, as the text says, that it results in a long life. Certainly, we run the risk of a short life if we're very foolish. Again, with the exceptions. But we also know it's very important to live according to the law of God live according to his commandments. And again, what we see in the New Testament is that law is fulfilled in loving God and loving others. So what decisions need to be made in order to carry that out? What the author is going to do in this text is list out different ways that wisdom can be applied, the benefits of it. And then as you get into chapter 10, specific wisdom type sayings that apply to different aspects of life. So what the author is doing here as a prelude to the commands and the instructions and the, uh, the, the teaching is that when you get ready to read chapters 10 and on, make sure you remember them. Make sure that you bind them, that they are ever close to you. This is a way to grow in relationship with God, a way to grow in relationship with other people. Wisdom is a hard thing, but it can be attained. There are many places in life where we need to apply wisdom. And as I said, many places in my life, I have failed to apply wisdom and paid the consequences for it. I know that you are wise, and uh, you can give me examples of how your wisdom has uh, helped make your life more meaningful. I'm working on that, and I know many of you are as well. I just want to encourage you as we go through the book of Proverbs, continue to keep in mind this mindset that I want to learn what God has to say to me in these texts and put them into practice, and then we will bear the fruit as a general practical truth. We will pray that God will continue to watch over and care for us as we do this. Uh, by way of application, then, clearly the imperatives are to keep these close, to obey them, to put them into practice. We are like those little Hebrew children. We are ever in need of instruction, ever in need of the Father's hand and guidance. And he has given us these Proverbs to live them out. I pray that you will continue to read through chapter 1 and through 9, be able to continue to see the value of wisdom. We will see specific Proverbs different guides for life. We'll be able to categorize them and look at them and how they can meet different needs in our lives. But it's important to know that the author decided that nine chapters were necessary, what we call nine chapters, were necessary to get the prelude, the preparation for all these wisdom sayings that he's going to provide. Because ultimately, all these wisdom sayings, as individual as they are, paint a big picture of what it means to be the wise person to avoid foolishness, to be the righteous person God's called us to be, and to avoid unlawfulness or lack of, uh, or lawlessness, I should say. Continue to join me as we go through the next two lessons, which also stem from chapter three, and we'll dig a little deep. Uh, next week, we'll see is a very popular, very well-known passage. 
Let's have a word of prayer and we'll talk about that. Father, we thank you for your word. I pray that you will help us to seek after you. I pray that you will help us to know your word and your commands that we will not just hear them, but we will bind them to our necks, around our necks, and uh, write them on the tablet of our hearts. Help us to keep these commands close so that we can carry this wisdom out at the appropriate time. We thank you for the word of promise that comes by seeking wisdom. I pray that you would help us to emulate wisdom in such a way that first it honors you, but then can draw others to you, that they will see um, the decision makes the, the decisions we make that are God honoring and others will desire to do the same. Lord, I pray that you help us as we seek wisdom. We know that we are lacking wisdom often. We thank you that you've provided a way for us to be wise. Help us then to live by way of your Holy Spirit, what it means to be a disciple of Jesus as we follow his example of wisdom as well. We know that we often fall short and we thank you for your grace and mercy and forgiveness. Help us with these words to seek out wisdom, to hold on, not forget, and not let go of the truth not let go of what we have in love and kindness and that we would have in faithfulness. Help us to bless you in all that we do. Guide us into wisdom, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as we look then for the next lesson, we're going to be looking at just the next few verses. We're going to be looking at Proverbs 3, 5, and 7. I know that 3, 5, and 6 are very familiar to you. We're going to title this Surrender Your Time. Uh, what we've done is we've looked at surrender your time, or I should say surrender your trust, that trust is going to come in the text we're looking at. We talk about surrendering our time today. We're talking about what it means to give God uh, our lives so that he can fill it with time for service to him, surrendering our time to him. Look forward to sitting with you and talking with you again in the next lesson. Until then, uh, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance to you and give you peace.